This is StoryBeat, storytellers on storytelling. An exploration into how master storytellers and artists develop and build brilliant stories and works of art that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators of all kinds find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on StoryBeat. We're coming to you from the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. Well, my guest today, Mark Clayton Southers, is an award-winning playwright, photographer, scenic designer, theatrical producer, and stage director. He's the founder and producing artistic director of the Pittsburgh Playwrights Theatre Company, where he's produced over 140 full-length and one-act plays, including August Wilson's complete 10-play Pittsburgh Century Cycle. Not long after Mark attended a master class in playwriting conducted by August Wilson at the Grahamstown Arts Festival in South Africa, he attended the Edward Albee Theater Festival in Valdez, Alaska, where he did seated readings with August Wilson of all of his plays. These encounters encouraged Mark to take up playwriting and devote more time to theater arts. In 2003, Pittsburgh Playwrights Theater Company was born, producing August Wilson's Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, which received critical acclaim and high praise from the playwright himself. Mark's play, Ma Noah, was the recipient of the 2004 Theodore Ward Prize at Columbia College, Chicago. His poem play, Angry Black Man Poetry, had a successful run at Teatro Schlosky in Katowice, Poland in 2009. A few of Mark's directing credits include Paul Robeson for the Griot Ensemble Theatre Company, Dutchman for Bricolage Production Company, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, The Piano Lesson, and Radio Golf for American Stage Theater in St. Petersburg, Florida, Gem of the Ocean for Human Race Theater in Dayton, Ohio, which received a, a Best Director nod by the Dayton Metro News, Passing Strange for North Short Stage in Columbus, Ohio, and for the Pittsburgh Playwrights Theater Company, Mark has directed Dorothy Six, The Piano Lesson, Two Trains Running, which was named one of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette's top ten plays of the decade, Seven Guitars, Value Mart, Jitney, which was voted one of the Post-Gazette's top ten best plays of 2010, and Gem of the Ocean. Mark is a four-time recipient of the AACTA Onyx Award for Best Director. You can discover much more about Mark Clayton Southers at markclaytonsouthers.com. It is a great privilege and a true pleasure for me to welcome the extraordinarily talented Mark Clayton Southers to Storybeat today. And we also have in the studio Mark's daughter, Ashley. So we're welcoming her to the show today, too. Welcome to you both. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for having us. Oh, Thank you. You're, you're very welcome. My pleasure. So, Mark, tell us a little bit about your history. How did you, in the first place, ever get enamored with or sucked into this world that some of us are in called theater, entertainment, and so on. How did it start for you? Well, I started out as a photographer with the Pittsburgh Courier. Um, actually, at Shinley High School, I started out as a photographer for the Triangle, the, the school's um, newspaper. And I was sent to um, Rochester Institute of Technology during the summer, along with our class president, Marty Matthews. And we went up there and um, Trim Varden, who used to be the photographer for all the schools, mm -hmm. they sent two people from each school. So we went to New Jersey, and I learned more about photography during the summer program. And I came back, and then I was the photographer for the uh, yearbook. And that gave me a really good love for photography because my dad was a photographer. He did a lot of weddings. And so I went to college in Tuskegee Institute in Alabama for veterinary medicine. To be a veterinarian? Yeah, for pre-vet. Yeah, I couldn't <laughs> help a hamster right now. But <laughs> I went there, and I was still doing photography on the side, and someone broke in my room and stole all of my equipment oh, and my goodness. all kind of stuff. And I ended up dropping out, and I moved to Detroit, 
and the work of my uncle's car wars, El Dorado Nate's car wars. El Dorado Nate. El Dorado Nate. What yeah, a great name. I, I know. I started a play. I haven't gotten anywhere with it. But I was going to say, that's a title of a play. But he, 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 uh, he was a truck driver, and uh, uh, he had this car wars as well. And my brother was already up there. My older brother was already up there. So we, we went up there and stayed with him and worked. And we made really good money, and I was able to buy more camera equipment. So I went and got a job freelancing for a magazine called The Entertainer. Okay. Went backstage, met Donnie Marie Osmond, and met um, George Clinton, you know, all these folks at these different concerts. And then I moved back to Pittsburgh. And when I got back to Pittsburgh, I went to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh for photography. So you, so you essentially, you started off looking through a lens. This whole right. thing started off looking right. through lenses. Okay, go on to Art Institute. Yes, I was at the Art Institute of Pittsburgh for photography, and I started freelancing for the Courier. And then Dr. Vernell. Well, for our international audience, yeah, that's the Pittsburgh Courier. Yeah, the Pittsburgh Courier. I was uh, 18, and I started freelancing for them. And I was only there for about three or four months, and then the chief photographer left and took a job in North Carolina, G. Allen Williams. And so I was a chief photographer there at age 18. Wow. <laughs> and then I started freelancing and doing photography for Country Repertory Theater. And while there... I never really went to the plays. I just went and took pictures and left. And then my cousin called me and said, hey, man, I'm in this play called Among the Best by Rob Penny, and they need some more African-American actors. Uh, you should come down and hang out or just and read. And you had never acted before? Never, never. Um, had you been in front of people before? I have from- written before. Back in grade school, I wrote two little short little plays for our you know but never performed never well I actually did i performed it was you know we were up on stage making up <laughs> stuff um but I, I had a ventriloquist act you know and a little short guy in my class sat on my knee you know and he was you know that was a <laughs> joke but, <laughs> but but um so i started i went down and read and the actor who i was filling in for kept missing rehearsals he's actually a really good friend of mine now and she ended up casting me, Dr. Lee cast me in the play. Mm-hmm. And um, I was so excited about it. It was a Rob Pitty play called Among the Best. And I played Buck Leonard, okay, African-American um, Negro League baseball player. And um, How old were you at this point? Oh, 18, man. 19? No, no. I was, I was in my 20s. At okay. this point, I was in my 20s. All right. But, yeah. But... And, and I was doing great in rehearsal. I was killing in rehearsal. And then we were at Stephen Foster Memorial Hall, and I, I came. And my and my line is at the top of the play, and I, I run out on stage, and the lights come up, and I froze. <laughs> <laughs> and people are in the wings feeding me lines, you know, and I'm I'm just froze. It you, seemed like forever. You were what we call being up. You yeah. You I went up. Couldn't remember. I went anything. up. I went up. But that's how I got into it as an actor, and um. Um, then I was further down the line. I was in a play called um, Blues for an Alabama Sky mm-hmm. by Pearl Cleek, uh, Atlanta playwright, okay. novelist, uh, feminist novelist. Um, and I played the abortion doctor. The ab- yeah, wow. guy, okay. uh, not guy, um, Doc. Doc, the yeah. abortion doctor. Javon doc. Johnson played Guy. Got you it. Know, he was the flamboyant. Uh, guy in the play. Anyway, um, so doing that, did that start to get into your bloodstream that this was something that you really liked? Well, what happened is this was 1998, and um, my daughter was four, I think, at the time, right? Mm-hmm. She was four, <laughs> and my character gets shot, and I fell down, and she yelled out. And she started crying in the back of the it, back of the house. This was during the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she started crying. So then we explained to her after the show that it's just a play, and daddy's didn't really get shot for real. So then the next night she's there, or the next show she's there, and I get shot, and she yells, oh, "It's okay. He's not dead. It's just a play." You know. <laughs> but but during this play, um, my father passed away mm. in February of 1998, and. I um I felt compelled to write a letter to my older brother who um was always getting over in life. It seemed like you you know, your older brother always gets over in life. He has a nice car and everything's going good for him. And but I realized that 
him and my dad had this type of relationship. I guess my dad was helping him out a lot, you know. So I wrote a letter to my brother saying, hey, you know, don't, you're not going to lean on me the way you leaned on dad, you know. And um, I let Javon read it backstage, and he said, this is a nice poem. I said, it's not a poem. That's a letter to my brother. So this is how I got the writing. And he said, well, let me read it to you. And Javon read it like a poem. And I'm like, wow. So you were an, you had, fr- without any intention, you had a naturally rhythmic way of writing. I guess. I guess. But I... um. I convinced him to let me take his place in South Africa because he won the Lorraine Hansberry Award okay. for playwriting while he was at Pitt. Got it. Him and Derek Sanders were in the MFA program there. And um, I kept saying, hey, you know, I, want, I knew they were going to South Africa that summer to the Grampton Arts Festival. Right. And I said, oh, man, you know, I'm a photographer. I do video. I can come down. And they're like, nah, we're cool. We got it covered. And then he called me and said, hey, I need you to take my place because I can't go now. So that's how I got to South Africa, and that's how I got to meet August Wilson. And when I got to South Africa, I just started writing poems because he, you know, he's like, "Hey, you, 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 you know, you can write poems." So I'm like, "Okay." And it was a way for me to release things and uh, express myself. And then once I got exposed were, to August, were you as a before we get to August Wilson? Because mm-hmm. I know this is going to be big and important. Mm-hmm. Were you as a young person? Were you very fluent with the language? Were you very good at using the language to get what you wanted or your no, way? No, I, I wasn't. I, I was a jokester. A you jokester. Know, as, so, so you were taking words and using them to your advantage. I felt that you know to write poetry, you shrink down a sentence to one word, one or two words. You know, it was condensing the language. That's true for all writing, isn't right. it, Mark? That you want to write the least amount that you can possibly write and get your message across. Well, I'm going to write this down. You just, I'm going to take that <laughs> note from you. I'm, I'm still learning. I mean, I'm you know I'm still learning. I, I, I think I just got lucky. Did a lot of doors open for me mm-hmm. because of exposure and the people who I was around, like Rob Penny. You know, I, I was at the Country Writers Workshop, so you know, I learned a lot of stuff from Rob Penny. Um, I learned how to uh, have a better appreciation of women because, um, you know, just growing up, you know, it's a male-dominated society. Yeah, sure. you know, and and I'm still learning, but um, you know, um, when I when I started writing the poetry, it was about me being in Africa, like the moon was closer. It the seemed moon, like the moon was closer. Now, to, see, you said that right now, and that's poetry. Just you're saying that. I mean, the it moon felt. Closer. I could it's see poetry. the craters. I mean, I can. It was like I. It was like I was on a hillside in South Africa, you, and the moon was like you, right there. You could write a play called "The Moon Is Closer," and everybody <laughs> in Africa. Buy, in, 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 the moon is closer in Africa. <laughs> the moon is even closer better. in Africa. Yeah, even better. So okay, so now you're in Grahamstown, and you, yeah. meet, you meet the man himself. I met August Wilson, and at the time it was August Wilson. I had seen August Wilson before. I had photographed him before, but I never really was up close and personal with him. And um, we were staying there. Was he, at that point, a fairly well-known playwright? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. He was over there teaching a master class at at the university over there. Um, He had not written the complete 10-play cycle yet? No, no. It was was, was 1998. Okay. um, And he was working on King Hetley II. Got it. At the time. But not in South Africa. I didn't know nothing about King Hetley II because we hadn't had that discussion. But we were staying in a girl's dorm way up on the mountain. It was it was higher than Mount Washington, and um, it was it was four of us. Um, it was Neil Boyce, um, um, Derek Sanders, and um, Kevin. I forget his name. I know it. I can't think. But we were actors, and Neil was our business manager, and we all stayed in one room, but it was a big big room, and we uh, Kevin opened up a local paper and it said. August Wilson is teaching a master class on playwriting at the university, and it starts in 10 minutes. So we busted out the room, and we ran down this hill. It was like running down from Mount Washington or or higher, (laughs) seriously. And we get to the bottom of the hill. The college was up on the top of the next hill, the same height. And um, a guy pulls up in a car and hits the horn, and he's like, you want to ride up? And we're like, sure. And we jumped in, but he was a South African jitney driver. You know, we paid him a couple rand, you know, and we got up there. And we go into this room, and there's probably 200 people in this room. And there was a, um, a volume, like an aisle right down the middle, and then outside aisles, and it was packed. There were no seats. All the seats were gone. We stand up in the back room with about six or seven, eight, eight other people. 
and two people in the front row got up and walked out right like five minutes after we got there. And Derek Sanders and I looked at each other, and we ran down and sat in those front row seats, and August looked at us like, okay. You know, and then after— Did he recognize you? No, 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 I doubt it. No, he didn't know who we were, you know, but um, but we listened to it. And I had a brother, uh, one of those brother electric things you used to write on before cell phones was really prevalent, right. you know. I had a brother organizer, and I was taking notes like for a Javon. personal digital assistant. Yes, yes, and I was taking notes for Javon just to show my appreciation for letting me take his place. And he was a budding playwright. I said, I'm going to take all these great gems that August Wilson was dropping and give them to Javon, you know. I'll, I'll, I'll send them to him. And one of the things that August said is that words are free. Ooh. You know, and that's a gem there. That's a, that's a nugget. Words are free. Words are free. You know, you don't like what you write, write something else, you know, whatever. And he said, it's up to um, you to, um, you could put anything you want in a play, but it's up for you to make it make sense. You know, um, you know, write what you know, what you don't know, research it. But he also said, which was important to me, because I tried to write like a novel. You know, you everybody writes a journal. They want to write something. Mm-hmm. You get to a certain point and you stop. Okay, what's next? And he said, you can start anywhere you want in the play, you know, and then you, you put it together. You can start anywhere you want. And that opened up a big door for me because that that removed that was like putting a stent in my mind you know what i mean to open up the flow of of thought because i i was against a wall like oh you can start anywhere you want so you can write something here and here and then put it together you know and it reminds me of that that tom cruise movie where he was moving the stuff around on the screen you know what i mean a a minority report yeah 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 so so that was major for me and um i still i walked out there thinking oh man maybe i should write plays but so Derek and I were afterwards, we were sitting there at a cafe in the same building, and August was talking to an African-American woman uh, who was from Atlanta, I guess, and we waited our turn, and we went over and sat down with him. We spent 45 minutes talking to him. He read some of my play, my um, poems off of my organizer. Right. You know, he said, oh, I like your style, and said, you know, really nice things. And Derek talked about Pan-Africanism and, you know, playwriting and stuff like that. And then um, but that was it. And then two months later... I get a call from Javon saying, hey, man, my play got accepted in the um, Edward Albee Theater Conference uh, up in, in Alaska. Valdez, Alaska. Right. And, and um, I, you know, I worked in the steel mill at the time. You know, so I had a good paying job. He's like, I need some help. You know, you can help me out. I said, well, why don't you give me the name of the, the people that you talking to up there? You know, I'll see if I can work some magic. So he gave me Dr. Jody... Um, I can't remember her last name. I know it. She was the president of Prince William Sound College. Okay. And I, I called her, and I finally got through to her, and I said, yeah, you know, a friend of mine, Javon, and uh, his play got accepted. I said, he's a college student, you know what I mean? Do you have any scholarships or anything you can help out with? You know, I'll do our best on our end, but we'll keep, she said, well, we'll put him up, you know, but you have to. he has to get his own way up here, and that's the way they do it. And putting them up means bring a tent and you can stay in the you can stay in the gym. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? At, so, le- at least you're not dealing with grizzly bears. Right, right, right. So I said, well, <laughs> I said, well, we just got back from South Africa, because um, she said, oh, we're we're honoring August Wilson this year. That's what she said. I said, oh yeah. So I said, oh, okay, cool. So somewhere in the conversation, I said something along the lines as, um, well, we just got back from doing his play in in South Africa. And I was talking about Javon because we did Javon's play, Next Stop Ellipsis, in South Africa. And, and Jody says, she says, oh, can you come do it here? So I'm like, yeah, we could do it there. I said, but I'm back at, I'm back at the steel mill. I said, Javon, I took his place. He can come do it. She's like, no, I want the same people who did it in South Africa. So I said, okay, all right, cool. She overnighted. She next day sent us overnight, same thing. She sent, it took two days. She sent us tickets, round trip airline tickets. To Alaska, to Alaska for Javon, Derek, and myself mm-hmm. to come up to Alaska for this festival, which was taking place in a few weeks. And she said, "Can you send me the script?" I said, "Okay." So I mailed her, I overnighted her the um, Javon script. So we're I called and told Derek and Javon. They didn't believe me. 
they're like, yeah, you're you're full of crap, you know. <laughs> and I said, nah, I, I got the tickets here at my house. They sent she sent me plane tickets and everything. We're going, and they're putting us up in apartments. You know, they couldn't believe it. So they came over to the house. And I showed it to them, and then she calls. I think a day. No, nobody would have thought it would be that easy. Right? She called her. <laughs> well, here's here's why. She called two days later, and she said, "This isn't an August Wilson play. This is a Javon Johnson player." <laughs> I said, well, yeah, that's the play I was talking about. I thought you said you did an August Wilson play. I said, no. I said, we met August Wilson or whatever we did Javon's play. She <laughs> says, well, all right, you're going to come anyway, but you're going you're gonna to work. You're going to work for all this. You're going to do all these readings with August Wilson like that's punishment. Yeah, I'm like, like that's yeah. punishment. I'm like, okay. Okay, and that's right. Yeah, so he went up there and um, – no, no, Ella, hold, hold me back. You know, yeah, so. Ella Joyce was there. We worked with her, and we were all standing in the same place, and um, Delroy Lindo was there. And another actress, I can't remember her name, but she's on all these shows now. She's in all these movies now. Uh, my wife knows her name. But we had a great time. We hung out with August, and, you know, August went and smoked cigarettes. I didn't smoke, but I went out and hung out with him while he smoked, you know. You, you, I you, took one for the team. You, I took the you, secondhand smoke for the team. You realize if this had ha- happened to you in New York or Los Angeles yeah. or a big American city like it that, been different. it would have been totally different because right. he would have been hiding from people. Yeah. He wouldn't have been as easily accessible. Right. right. But you had him in a place yeah. where he felt very loose and free. Yeah. And I don't think he's the type of person that would have hid, but well, you know there would have been, been more handlers there, around. There would have you know? been a lot more people right. trying to tug and pull right. on him. Right. And you had him in sort of isolated in a bit of privacy. Yeah, it was cool. We had a, we had a really great time and um it was just a lot of fun and that's and this and this then was for you the that was a springboard to write plays this was the the door opener so right. to speak so i started writing plays yeah. so at this point you're in your mid-20s no, late 20s no early I, 20s no this is 1998 i was in my late 30s so you okay i didn't so, get into theater so, i didn't get into like um theater theater till i was like close to 30 years All right, old. so this is very important for yeah. the listeners. Um, you, by the time that you got to this juncture... Mm-hmm. I worked in a steel mill. You had life under your belt. Right. And this is something for Ashley to pay attention to, right. too, that you need to have some life under your belt in order to have stories to tell. Right, right. Because when you're 18, 19, 20 years old, sometimes you've got some stories to tell, but you haven't lived that much. Right. Right. right? And you ha- probably haven't lived too much away from your family. You've, right. You, so you had already had a certain amount of life experience. Right. And so you took this springboard mm-hmm. of meeting August Wilson, and it was... I will say relatively, and I mean that literally, relatively easy, that y- that you could then take that and translate it into well, storytelling. Well, I'm not going to say it was easy, but I'm going to tell you the, the things that were the bump in my universe is is that, for one, I worked at a steel mill. So it was real solitary. You know, I was a truck driver, heavy equipment operator, and, it, you know, great money, but it wasn't something you really enjoyed Were doing. there lots of stories from the mill? Probably, but I wasn't interested in those stories. You, you wanted know? to go away from those stories. Yeah, I, everything I write has to do with just different type of stuff, you know, what-if scenarios. But one of the it's things— It's not science fiction, though, is it? Yeah. Well, I have one. I wrote one science fiction one called Nine Days in the Sun. Okay. But but, but one of the things that really stood out, and, you know, had August Wilson graduated from Yale School of Drama, you know what I mean, I probably would never have gotten to, you know— a lot of people deal with self doubt. You know, we, we I, talked I about I would say this. it's the biggest problem yeah. that most artists have. We talked about this last night at our first read through for our, our next production and a lot of people mentioned it. And and was your play about self doubt? No, no. What it was is that what I'm getting at is if August Wilson had a degree in playwriting, it would have been something that was unattainable to me in my mind. I wouldn't have had the heart to try at try my stab stab at it. I see what you're saying. His success from someone who dropped out of school basically he, he taught himself in the library. You got system. courage from that. It, it's like okay, look, this man is the best playwright ever. You know, no question. And 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 this is even back then. You know, I would in say my mind. honestly, I've mm-hmm. said this to any number of people. It's for me, mm-hmm. it's Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. The 20th century, you get to a handful. You get to Eugene O'Neill. Mm-hmm. You get to maybe Edward Albee himself, right. Tennessee Williams. There are a handful of them. Right. And then there's August Wilson, who's in the league well, all by himself. Well, you know, it's like this. Me and you don't go to the same barbershop. So, you know <laughs> what I mean? It's Everybody has their own opinion. Okay. You know I mean? That's cool. I and mean, you have to respect and appreciate people's opinions. To me, he's the best playwright ever. Ever. 
you know, ever. Even better than Shakespeare for you. Well, you know, I haven't studied Shakespeare, although I'm supposed to be directing a Shakespeare play coming up. But, you know, there's a lot of talk that maybe Shakespeare didn't write those plays. I mean, well, all that's those been plays. Well, that's been going on. I know, me. I know. But <laughs> but I, I don't have a, a unappreciative, I'm not unappreciative of his work. But what I'm saying, what I, what I, what I really, the heart of it is what makes you feel a certain way. I feel a lot different about August Wilson plays than I would feel about Shakespeare plays. I understand. And I can appreciate and respect someone from England or someone from a um, European background and how they feel about sure. how how Shakespeare affects them of opposed course. to August Wilson, you know, it's, his it's, language, you but, know. But did you ever talk to August Wilson about where, where, how he got to where he got to be? No, but I know that he initially so, he was into the Irish playwrights and so things he, like that. So he clearly had studied. Oh yeah, he studied a lot, a, a yeah. lot of stuff. Right. And and what we all know is is that today's artists, whoever you mm. are, it doesn't matter. You're standing on the shoulders of whatever Absolutely. came before, Absolutely. and so you're standing on August Wilson's shoulders. Absolutely, the, the shoulders and, he stood and, on. And I'm gonna tell you, certain things happen in your life, and you might not know why, um, but they come back and they find their way. In, into the puzzle. Like, for Definitely. instance, Javon wrote a play, Javon Johnson wrote a play called uh, Handbone that we produced our very first season. And when I first read the script, I didn't get through the first act, and I found 17 direct references to August Wilson's plays, <laughs> which which showed me that, you know, of course he was... he was. Um, well, do you know if it was intentional or, or inadvertent? I don't think it was intentional. I think that... Um, it was subconscious. When you when you're when you're around certain things, you you I find myself when I write that's you know, I can't put that in. They're gonna think that's August Wilson, right? You know, but you but, absorb but so things. so we talked about this, and Javon talked to August about it, and August says, "Hey, tell your story, and whatever happens, happens." You know, he said, "There's there's nothing new under the sun." You know, everybody gleans, but uh, but Javon did go back and remove a lot of it and try to make it more of his own. Sure. But the influence was there. So it's and, unavoidable. Yeah. Mark. And saying that, that that makes me want to you know, when I first did my first play, When the Water Turns Clear, Chris Ross and the Post Gazette critic who, um, who by the way has been on this show. Yeah, yeah. Chris Chris says to me he, he saw he says, I was expecting to see the Hill District. I didn't I, there's nothing about the Hill District in this play. <laughs> and because he was expecting me to follow suit with August Wilson. Of course. And that wasn't the case. You know what I mean? Um, so everybody has their own way of looking at things. But, so I try to write things that are different. Um, and I go out of my way to do that on purpose. But I think, but I think I found a, um, a area that works for me. Now, um, there, in my current play, there's a, a character named Dukum. Dukem? Yeah. Spell it. D U K E M. Okay, Dukem. Takes place in the eighteen hundreds. And um and when I wrote it I didn't think nothing of it. But in hindsight I'm like, wait a minute, that might be cause of the character Canewell in okay. Seven Guitars. Okay. You know, when they say you do he sure does cane well because my character, the la- lady told me sure do come in handy. You know what I mean? <laughs> so but I left it there and I like, you know what? I owe that to August, and I, I thank him for that. I thank him for 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 the creativity that um, I'm gleaning off of, and I, I don't it, mind saying that. You it, know, it, from my perspective, it's not possible for an artist not to have yeah. the influences bubble up through. Right, right. And I think as long as you acknowledge it, it's fine. So mm-hmm. right now, so now currently, I'm working on. I was working on a play cycle called the Culture Clash, and I wrote three plays. Um, culture class whereas you know if you you look at theater um there's a certain privilege that um caucasians can get from theater that okay we we're you know a lot of theater deals with us you know if you go to any high schools most of the plays are doing 90 percent of them 98 percent of them are white plays so the african-american students um have to do roles that are are not just going to prepare them for an August Wilson play, probably. Of course. Now I'm I'm actually in my third play at Kappa. I'm directing Joe Turner's Come and Go. So let's now. tell what, the audience what Kappa is. Kappa is the Pittsburgh School for the Performing Arts. Right. Downtown Pittsburgh. It's it's um, our advanced high school students right. who are very artistically inclined. Right. Melissa Perlman is the, is is the principal there, and um, um, she she has me directing a play 
each year there. That's wonderful. Uh, so this is the third one. Um, and it's it's daunting, you know, when you're, you're dealing with youth trying to um, digest all these August Wilson monologues and language. And so, but it really prepares them for the next stage. I'm going to tell you that much. I think if you can do an August Wilson play, you can probably pretty much do anything. Well, I'm telling you, man. But, um, you know, so I, I, I appreciate the journey. And getting back to what I was saying about um, August's influence, um, I started writing this culture class series, and it was supposed to be seven plays. And my idea was to take um, a different culture and introduce an African-American uh, a play that has to deal with the Jewish culture, African American culture, Irish, African American, in, in Italian. Each, in each play, you're right. In you're, each play, got it. And we could talk about the differences we have in the play, find so that's ways to the do culture it. Culture class, right? So the first play was 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 called um, um, Hoodwinked, and it was about a, a Jewish couple, elderly Jewish couple, who wanted to move back into the Hill District, okay, and to their former home. So for those that don't know, because, again, we've got mm. an audience that's outside of Pittsburgh. Mm. Um, for those that don't know, the Hill District was at one time, more than 100 years ago, it was a, a Jewish community. Well, it was a multicultural, and, and yeah. It, if you then, listen to August Wilson's— Then it became more right. of an African-American community. Yeah. yeah, August writes about it in his his play, How I Learn What I Learn, which was just done by Wally Jamal. Um, um, and just all kind of ethnicities. How, how many of the 10 August Wilson plays are set in the Hill? Nine. Nine. Yeah, nine— um, uh, the only one is Mulroney's Black Bottom, which takes place in Chicago, which is about to be filmed. Ruben Santiago Hudson wrote the screenplay for the next mm. one that Denzel's producing, along with Costanza Romero, August's widow. But um, so I, I wrote this play about this Jewish couple that moved back into the hood, you know, into their former house because the wife is suffering from a lung disease and she wants to spend her final days in a house that they were married in, they mm -hmm. grew up in. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, but she's lying. She's not dying. Her daughter died in that house when she was a baby. And she wants to come reach out to the spirit of her daughter who she thinks still lives in the house. Wow. So it's a comedy. You know? It's a comedy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But one of the brothers who owns it, uh, girlfriend kicks him out they get into it he moves he moves he tries to move back into the same house at the same time the older brother rented out didn't tell him so he, they're all living in there together dealing with it. <laughs> yeah it's pretty wild but the other one is is about the um <clears throat> irish and i went to ireland like five times to do research i went to kilty mall um I, i've been to um um several different cities in Ireland. But you 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 believe in research, yes? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because if you don't know it, like August is, you don't know it, then you have to research it. Yeah, I think that's yeah. that's right. And, yeah. and clearly, if you grew up in Pittsburgh, you might know a little bit about Irish culture, right. but you really won't know it in any depth. Well, I, you know, working in a steel mill, I had, when I went to Ireland, I was going, because um, my wife's a flight attendant, so that helped out a whole lot. I, mean, it I did. just had to pay the taxes to go over there. But, um, the Irish guys would ask me to bring him something back. When I went to Poland, um, Polish guy asked me to bring him some rosaries. You know, no, seriously, they of course. And these these guys are a hundred percent Polish and has never been to Poland. And here, you know, is this African American guy that works in the mill. He's going to your home. You know what I mean? It's a different. <laughs> I don't know, it, but it made our relationship a lot stronger, too. I think it's important for the listeners to understand what Mark's talking about is that mm. uh, uh, it's not just – it's it's very good to do book research and to mm -hmm. talk to people that are right. local that you might know, but actually going to the real place, mm -hmm. there's almost no substitute and for And I probably it. wouldn't have done it had my wife not been a flight attendant, you know, with major airlines where I could go for you, 60 bucks. You've had a lot of serendipity in your life, haven't you? You <laughs> well, go off to you, – you weren't supposed to go to South Africa. You right, go to South Africa. Right. You, you suddenly meet August Wilson. Where do you wind up a couple months later with August Wilson right. in Alaska? Yeah. You, you, you have a – you marry someone who winds up being a flight attendant who gets well, you a, that advantage. You're very yeah. – you live a very serendipitous life, which yeah. is helpful, by Except the way. Except for – Except for, part card, of the except for the accident well, of 2015. Well, that's a that's Which, a whole other story. Yeah, we're going to try to make lemonade out of that steel. Well, I, <laughs> and I believe you will. I believe you will make lemonade out of it. Yeah. I, want, I want to focus this a little bit about how you do what you do mm -hmm. as, as a writer and a director and so on. Right. Um, do you, at this juncture in your life and career, do you believe that you have, um, how long has it been since you thought you were good at it? I think you're probably pretty good at it. Do well, you think you're good at it? Um I think that, um, hmm, yeah, 
I do. I, the, I do. Nothing I'm, I'm going to take a page from the Wally Jamal book and not be afraid to um, talk about how you really feel about stuff without worrying about what other people think. I think um, that's right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm still learning in that at, aspect. At, at, obviously, you're still growing. We right. all continue to grow. I think well, the day you stop growing, you're in trouble. Right. But but the, the question is, at what point, at what point in your journey up till now, did you say to yourself, you know what, I got this. I know how to do this. Well, you know, when I won the Theater Award Prize in 2004, I was on top of the world because it's a national prize. I'm like, okay, cool, you know. And I stopped sending my plays out. I didn't send them out anymore uh, for some strange reason. And I think it had also to do with the fact that I I started my theater company and I could produce my own plays. Mm-hmm. So I have some. I have a huge advantage over other playwrights. No doubt. And and I think it's, I've earned that like a, though. It's like a painter you know? with their own gallery. Right. Exactly. And that, that's the way I approached it. I'm like, you know, if I was an auto mechanic, I would have a garage. If I was a carpenter, I have a wood shop, or either I'd be Jesus. But you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. But if you know what I mean, though. But it, you you have to you have to prep yourself. You know, you have to put things in front of yourself and make good of it. And so when Michael Motes decided to shut down the theater, I talked to him about it. No one thought I was serious, but I took a home equity loan out, and I had a turnkey operation now. Okay, now we've got to put stuff on stage. You you literally put your money where your mouth was. I did. I did. And so so I didn't really feel so bad. I mean, I'm sure there are playwrights that are pissed that, you know, okay, you know, oh, oh guess who? Oh, he's doing his own play again, you know, whatever. Well, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um I'm probably the worst artistic director when it comes to reading people's plays. I don't like to judge people. You know, I produce 90% of the plays off of the idea that okay. they pitch. Not that I read the play. I rely on really good directors to take the script and read the script and break it down. And dramaturgs like Kyle, Dr. Kyle Bosch, who works with us a lot now. And I look for really good directors who are not just hungry, but know what the hell they're doing you know what i mean because that's what's important with, with, how, how do you make that determination how do you know somebody's good at what track doing? record or conversations that we have do you, you know then what go I mean? see their work oh absolutely you go see absolutely work. there's some people we i just can't afford but you know i'll, I'll bring folks in but um Are you talking uh, about bringing them in from where new york la somewhere wherever, like wherever wherever yeah yeah, yeah i tried to bring a director in from ireland for the ray warner festival but he couldn't work it out on his schedule but um steve curley um, but but anyway, the thing the thing is is that um, I I um, I have this also this advantage that that um, a lot of playwrights I know that sometimes when you're writing a play and you say hmm I can't because you know you know as a writer the characters once you create your characters or in the process of developing your characters they just start talking. And you write what they say. You write it down. Okay, so this is very important. This yeah. is a good part of process. When you, so let's back up half a step. Okay. Well, before we get to the character mm-hmm. development. Well, how, hold on, how, hold on, hold on. Let me get this thought out real quick. Sure, sure. Before we do that. Sure. Um, I don't have to worry about things being criticized to get the green light to get the production. Because you're green lighting. I'm the green lighter, <laughs> but. Some playwrights will say, I can't put that in. You're not going to produce my play if I put that in there. You they, know? They, they self-edit and inhibit themselves. Right, You're, right. You can I don't be uninhibited. Have, I'm uninhibited. And that's that's one of the things that I, I've, I'm grateful for because I can just write. So, you know what I mean? So the lesson in here to all playwrights is Get your produce shit. your own <laughs> plays. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, okay, so, so let's go. Let's t- take a half step back and we'll come to characters because okay. it's very important. Right. Somehow, somehow, somewhere, some way, you get an idea. I want to do a play about X, mm-hmm. whatever X is. Malcolm. Malcolm. Okay. Where do you begin? Once you're there, what's your first step? What's the first thing you do? Well, let's not say Malcolm X because that's going to go down a different road. If I have an idea. Let's do something that's, that's, that's crazy... an original idea rather than right. something based on. Well, what... I'm going to talk about my current play. Great. Is that cool? That's it's called Absolutely. Savior Samuel. And it's it's we don't talk about. What what was the inspiration for it? Um, what if? But what was the inspiration? What if what? Struck. What if what if the second coming happened already and we missed it? Okay, you know that's pretty that's pretty big subject. Yeah. So, so all right. So now where do you begin from there? What do you do? So so the idea was who could have been Christ? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna make 
him in the image of 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 the, who my kids or 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 can um you know my folks my community can gravitate toward you know uh, I think the fact that African Americans have been catching hell for 400 plus years um I think I think he should come in the form of an African American a very interesting idea you know so that's what I did <laughs> that's what I did and then I had to make the story make sense. Did this come to you in a flash, or did it take time for you to come come to that uh, that conclusion? It came in a flash. Okay. Um, it's always. I mean, I think. Uh, I think if you ask a lot of people, uh, I mean, you grow up thinking that. You grow up, and you here's the deal: when you grow up, and you first adver- you face adversity, and you face um, negative comments from people. Sure. You know, I was playing baseball at. We had an away game. I I won't say it was school, but it was. A school, not it was a away game. Okay. And a busload of we were in a white neighborhood, and a busload of white kids rode by, and, they, and the bus stopped in traffic. And I'm in the outfield, and some kid yells out the window, "Bus my butt! I smell a nigger!" Oh, you geez. know what I mean? And as a 17 year old, I'm like, "What the? F-? You know what I'm saying?" Now, now these days, you, you know, he might have got capped. You know, <laughs> somebody might have capped his ass. <laughs> But back then in the 70s, late 70s, I'm like, that was totally unnecessary. You know, I'm, I'm walking along fishing with my brother, and I'm walking along a dirt road out in North Park, and a car runs past me and cuts over and tries to – I'm walking across a little bridge. almost makes me jump you're, off the bridge. You're on foot. Yeah. And I'm like 9, 10 years old, you know, and I get the N-word, you know, a bunch of N-words, you know. And these things stick with you, you know, and it depends on how you're raised. depends on how you grow up on how much it hurts. It depends on how deep you can, you know, I haven't even talked about that ever, I don't think, that second one. But um, these things are, they, they get in your subconscious, you know. And, no and no it, way they don't. You know, so if I'm thinking about a savior, if I, you know, all these people are going to church every Sunday and people are praying to God and they're saying, oh, you know, we're going to get crowns in our our, 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 you know, and our, and our, we're going to get gems, and you know, the, the more good you do, and when you die, you're going to go to heaven, everything's going to be right. I'm like, hell no, I want things to be right now. I don't want to have to wait till I die to enjoy life, you know what I'm saying? But there's a lot of people who grew up, and it depends on how they were raised, a certain way, that they're fearful to say things like that. Well, I'm not fearful. I'm, I'm, if, if there's, if there was a second coming, maybe we missed it, and it could have been a black kid, you know? Oh, uh, I've asked the, that question for yeah. a long time. What yeah. it, would we buy the notion of a Messiah coming, a second Messiah today, if they were, if the Messiah were standing right in front of us, mm-hmm. or would we think that person was crazy in some way, or or being delusional, or would we think that? Right. I mean, those are questions. Because yeah. Well, we only use a. They say we only use a small portion of our mind. Like ten you know percent. I mean? So yeah. So and you know when you dream. And you know it's a vast universe when you dream. You go, and everything makes sense. You know, you analyze your dreams and you wake up, you're like, okay, yeah, all right, cool. You know, bam, bam, bam. You know, so that means that your mind is like, hey, I'm I'm in autopilot, and I'm going to use a lot more than you use during the daytime. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but it all makes sense. It's all compartmentalized at all. All right, you know so I mean? so let's get let's go to, to the process on this. All right, now you've got this idea. It's a really good idea. I right. think it's a good idea. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's now all about execution, is it not? All right. Well, it's about getting the characters, the development, the location. So how do you do that? The what, setting. What is it you do? Well, I think about the setting. I, you know, I, I have to start painting the canvas. So I, you know, where are they at? They're in a the log cabin. You know, what's what are they doing for a living? You know, are you are thinking, they trading with the Indians? Are you at that moment thinking about the? Uh, restrictions of, of production or not? No, I never think about that. Never think because about I'm it. a producer. Okay, I never think about that. Okay, so you're yeah. writing what what you believe is right. needed for the work itself. Right, you can always reel reel back in. So you know the the tip is to just have at it and let folks reel you back in. You know what I'm saying? That's, well, it's it's always better to go way out beyond the ca- capability right. and come back right, right. than to try to pad out too. Yeah, it. yeah, because I think a, l- a lot of folks think. And, you know, I'm 57, you know, I, I'm i like, where did all the time go? But I know that there was a lot <laughs> Tell of, me about there's it. a lot of time, <laughs> a lot of times when I thought to myself, you know, uh, I can't go to Hollywood, be an actor, because I'm 30. 
Well, I can't go because I'm 40. I can't go because I'm 50. You know what I mean? Well, that's a self-inhibiting restriction. Right, person. right, right. So, but that's the way that I would always think. You know what I mean? That was I was just going to keep doing what works for me. You know what I mean? But when it comes to writing, you have to be, you know, you have to, you can't let things affect your campus. You can't let other people's failures do, or whatever. Do you have a, an audience in mind as you're writing? No. You have no mm. audience in mind at no. all. You're not thinking about the public or no. who's going to care about this or any no. of those things. You're writing the story because the story is speaking to you. Yeah, I've written plays and never even sent them out. I mean, well, again, you you've had this advantage where you can actually yeah, produce your own. Yeah, plays. but but just have for you writing. Had, have, I assume you've had plays produced that you didn't have anything to do with. That you're. Oh your yeah, work. yeah, yeah, yeah. So in other words, yeah. did, did that come from you sending it out, or did it come from somebody seeing it and recommending People it? Somebody have. Um, read uh, the publication um best best black plays that came out that had the one of my one play in it and then actors talk about stuff out out there in the world you know and it happens um so andrew just, paul was andrew paul um from kinetic theater mm-hmm. former artistic director of the pick sure. he's the one him and dr ramsey were responsible for getting me me and andrew were in london and we were sharing a room we were in london uh, we went to a play festival um and we, he was saying, yeah, you know, Theodor Slosky, they're trying to do something about Obama. And I'm like, well, there's no plays about Obama yet. I said, but I wrote a play that um, is inspired some poetry, you know, and that's how he hooked me up. He he got me in at Theodor Slosky, you know, because I was there the year Andrew, before. Andrew did. Yeah, and I had been here before because I went and saw stuff happen that he he directed there. So I knew the artistic director, and, um, and it worked out really nice. I was able to take a, a handful of actors over with me. So let's talk about the challenges of producing and directing. Mm-hmm. We've talked quite a bit about story creation. Right. Um, so, all right, now you've got your play or you've got an August Wilson play, mm-hmm. which clearly is well known. Right. Um, where do you begin as a producer? What's the, what? How do you put a show on? What is mm-hmm. your process there? Well, I talked to my, my grant writer, Elizabeth Rees. Okay. And uh, we also use Susan Blackman as well. She helps out. But I talked to Elizabeth, and we talk about um, the type of funding that we would need, um, what actors were bringing in, things of that nature, and it's 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 it continues to build every year. Uh, what we're doing. Well, that's that's the ideal. Yeah, yeah. Is to continue to so build. So we talk it. about that, and she talks about what what foundations might be the best to go after for the main support, um, and then we have ones to give us funding annually for for our, for our budget. That we put toward it, so we earmark what dollars are going to go toward it, you know, and what the ticket sales might be based upon prior, you know. Uh, whenever you do August Wilson, you get a lot of support. People will support it. Now, when you do an unknown playwright, it's very hard to get support. Because so. I know you did, uh, uh, you did in the heat of the night, didn't you? Yes. yes. And so that's Matt Pelfrey wrote that. Right. And he, I work with Matt here at right. school here right. at Point Park. Right. Uh, and. Um, so when you let's just use that as an okay. example because it's neither yours nor August right, Wilson's. Right, right. So now you have in the heat of the night and you've decided you're going to do it. Right. Um, did you direct it? No, Montez Freeland. Oh, that's right, Montez Freeland. So that was the first step is to get a really good director on it. Okay. Who understands the text? So so that becomes the, a key is mm-hmm. knowing that someone can interpret this text in a way right. that will be appealing to right. to someone other than perhaps you. Right. 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 Because you obviously need others to come to the show. Absolutely. So, uh, uh, okay, so once you've got your director on board, how do you start to work with that director? Do you let them go or do you work with them closely? Well, I'll work closely, but I don't really, I mean, we talk about the casting decision, but those decisions are, are basically his. Depends on the, 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 the level of the director and who he knows. Like when, Mont, when when Monte Russell came from out of town, we had auditions, but I helped him a lot with the casting just as far as dependability and you know whether people are going to you know things like that, but um, well, certainly actors get reputations just like anybody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, to be honest, quite honest with you, a, a, a lot of actors who might have a dependability issue it might be because they're working a bunch of jobs. And you know, Whatever one thing reason. we don't want to do is we don't want to keep the artistic um, folks out of the room. It's people that are. You know, the, sometimes the ones you have the most problems with are usually the best actors. <laughs> I have to say it. That's not saying you know, you know, be like that. But a lot of times it happens. I just, I, I know. But um, you, you want to get a good actor on board and to, to anchor it, and you want to build your cast around that actor, you know, or actors, 
you know, people who work well together. A lot of chemistry so, has a lot to do so with it. So it, it, this <clears throat> is part of what I think of in my own mind as a as a total package of what I call programming. Mm-hmm. You, you're going to – here's your play. You know that it's going to have an appeal to a certain – hopefully a lot a wide audience but right. it may only have a narrow appeal it might mm-hmm. and whatever that appeal is now you need to cast it in a way that hopefully keeps that appeal wider so you're going to program it with actors right. you're going to you're going to program your season you're going to program your actors you're going to program your director all that's programming right. my, to my way of absolutely thinking. and so uh you this is very important to you i'm assuming from what you're telling me um that that how you package that show with its totality, mm-hmm. the designers and so on, right. is a very important thing. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and that it's not willy nilly or random. Mm-hmm. You're just you're actually f- doing something that that it uh, used to be willy nilly <laughs> before you knew what you're doing. Yeah, right? back in the day. Well, because yeah. you you didn't have a reputation built yet. Right. 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 And you were probably I'm going to guess you were probably struggling pretty hard at the beginning to make that happen. I was, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we were, I, I was designing the set, building the set. Painting and, the set. Yeah, well, <laughs> Diane's always been our painter, but yeah. <clears throat> um, I, I'm, willing, wear a lot I'm, of hats. I'm willing to bet you pulled a, you had a, a paintbrush in your hand more than once. Uh, just to make the stage all black. That's again. what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm not, saying not to not to <laughs> not the really nice stuff that she does. But, yeah, but um, that's just the way it is in small theater. Okay, so for you, let's go to a slightly different way of looking at the world. For you, what makes a story good? What makes a good story good? Can you can you define that? Well, I mean, we do a well. I want to answer that question, but I want to say first that a lot of scripts that we get, we first of all, we only produce Pittsburgh playwrights. So at the top of that canon is August Wilson and, and you know, George Kaufman. You talk about Pulitzer Prize winning so, playwrights. So both both aren't are are Pittsburgh playwrights. Right. Yeah. And then you but got Tammy you got Tammy wor- Ryan. Playwrights. Yeah, yeah, you got Tammy Ryan, you know Gab Ted Cody. Hoover. Uh we haven't produced Gab yet, but that that's, that's a possibility. But she's so busy she's she gets snatched up so quick. But there's a bunch of great playwrights, you know, Lisa Brennan. There's a lot of great playwrights Absolutely. in the city. But but um, I'm always looking to to try to give everybody pa- a shot. Part of your mission then is local playwrights. That is it. Yeah, that is that the is mission. It. Okay. So so when we talk about that, a lot of times we get scripts that are new. You know, ninety percent of our plays have never been produced before. So we do a lot of world premieres. You're, you're on top of everything else. I, I have to say this: you're very brave. Yeah. Well, I mean, it takes courage. That's to what do we that. do. We, we're the Pittsburgh playwrights, so we produce Pittsburgh playwrights. So, in in so when you're working on a world premiere, a play has never been done before. You know, you're out, you're out in the wild west. You know what I mean? And you have to, you know, you want to <laughs> make sure why it you're works brave out. Brave and have courage. Yeah, you want to make it work out. So you're you're you're. It's a lot of work, you know. It's a lot of work, a lot of trust, and a lot of times, um, it's the actors that take it to another level. Uh, there's no question. Yeah. The, the director and the actors will yeah, take it to a whole other level. Yeah, the director and the actors will take it to a whole other level. It's like if we get a script and it's a seven, you know, that the plan is to make it a nine or a ten. You know what I mean? Um, I have I have about ninety produced teleplays, mm-hmm. and not one of them wasn't plussed by the actors. Yeah. Yeah, every I mean. single one of them is plussed by the actors. Right, right, right. You think yes. you think, well, how are they going to make this any good? And then they turn some That's kind the of the beauty of it garbage into something great. Yeah, well, you not know. garbage. But, well, I'm talking know. about me. I'm yeah. talking about me. When something I'm... unedible to something edible. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> something that sort of looks like it might be tasty, but isn't really until you add the right ingredients. That's yeah, right. that's correct. That's hey, it's it's, it's <laughs> hey man, it's 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 uh, it's the theater gods what, blessing. What you. would you say you do differently now mm-hmm. that you didn't do when you started? That that actually you now know in learning that has worked so much better. Not spending my own money. Not spending your <laughs> own money. That's the truth. Yeah, I mean, I used to I used to pay the rent out of my pocket um, for two years, you know, fifteen hundred bucks a month. Were you going broke every month? No, I was using U.S. Steel money, you know, that yeah. I had to go work for. <laughs> um, I guess I still build sets from time to time. What do but, what do what have you done from day one that you still do? You know, works. Whether it's directorial, writing, uh, producing, what is it that you that you've brought all the way forward? Um, I, I guess the marketing, the, the posters to go out working with my good buddy, Eric Donaldson and, 
making sure that you know we get it out there. So from day one, that was the, you know that the 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 strategy image. for marketing the image. Yeah, yeah, ha- has worked always on the image. Yeah, I took the pictures or or you know helped was that, that well thought through or is that just fortuitous um, in, in the beginning? Yeah, it's, it was just a lot of luck. Yeah, yeah, just <laughs> you hit a formula that worked. You, yeah, you, you, and you yeah. just got lucky. I about mean. It. Things different things work for different people. Like some folks like posters without a whole lot of stuff on them. I love posters without a whole lot of stuff on them. But I know that the audience I'm trying to get, you, I want to get the information in front of their face. Then I don't want to. I don't want to rely on them going to our website to get all the information. I want to give them a bunch of information right here. So if you just look at it the one time, at least you know the dates, and at least you know where it's at. You know. You, that's very smart of you because. Uh, you don't want to rely on somebody else taking initiative. Right. You want to give it to them at, right. at one time. Right. So they might, the posters might look a little messy, you know, but. Okay. So, all right. So last big question before we get to the last two. Okay. Okay. How do you refresh the well when you're tired and burnt out and you've had enough and you're, I can't do another day of this. How do you refresh the well? What do you do? Well, I'm going through a spell right now. Um, I've, I've been in a funk since February of, um, last year. I, I, I am aware of it yeah, because I've been so reading I've about had, it on a regular basis. Yeah. Multiple, multiple surgeries and, um, multiple infections. Well, go ahead and tell the audience you had a bad accident in 2015, right? Yeah. I had a major car accident with my wife and I, and, um, broke my back and almost lost my leg and mm. broke my hip and all this stuff. And, um, uh, was doing really good doing really well recovering from it and we were in um edinburgh scotland in 2017 mm-hmm. with my um, play miss julie clarissa and john at the festival and it's so you know when you go to festivals it's walking everything's walking and i couldn't keep up with everybody and everybody's having a good time and getting good food and going to see different things and i found myself sitting in the vehicle because i was like the uber driver like i drove everybody around <laughs> you know and i couldn't keep up and it was really I couldn't enjoy the process, you know what I mean? Um, well, you found that demoralizing? Yeah, yeah. So I told my wife about it. and We got back. I called a, a friend who was a surgeon because they, they wouldn't operate on my leg here in Pittsburgh because the guy who saved my leg was 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 the top dog, and he, he was like, get used to it. That's just I couldn't bend my leg past 60 degrees or mm. so. And they like, that's the new you. And, and they, he's, he's telling the truth, you know. He's being truthful. But I wouldn't get my knee replaced anyway out in another city. And um, it worked great. I was riding my bike and exercising. And, and um, then three months later, I was doing some electrical work. I was putting some lights in on the ladder. I got down, sat down. I was talking with a good friend of mine for about a half hour. I went to stand up, but I couldn't move. Mm. I limped down the steps and got in the truck and drove home. And... My friend carried me in the house, and that night my temperature shot up to 102.5 or something like that. So she took me to the emergency room and found out that it was septus, sepsis, whatever it's called. From the knee operation? From, from Yeah, from a head and infection. So they put me in an ambulance and sent me for an hour drive to the hospital where I had the knee surgery done, and uh, they took my knee out and uh put a spacer in there and then I had another surgery two days. So I had like four or five surgeries. Um, and then this last surgery was in September and they put concrete in there. So I have a metal pipe in my leg. I can't bend my leg. Oh my goodness. And I've got antibiotic um, concrete in there. So I'm not in any pain. It's just get pain in the ass. It, but it, if anything, it's you just don't have great range of motion. I don't. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm, I'll probably will get another knee. And, you know, several months from now, you know, as the infection is eradicated, hopefully. But it's been a pain in the butt. But I haven't been able to really write. I've been writing Facebook opt-ads, but do you, I haven't Do you been... feel the need? Do you feel the urge? Well, I have several several plays that I've been working on. I'm, I have a commission um, that I'm working on um, for for a library. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was working on a one-man show, Cyril Weck. That I had to put on the back burner. Is that right? You're going to do a show about Cyril Wecht? Yeah, it's a one-man show, Cyril Wecht. For for those who don't know, Cyril Wecht is a very, very famous 
uh, pathologist, pathologist here in Pittsburgh, who's yeah. uh, for, who who was uh, the chief coroner in the yeah. county of Allegheny for a long, long time. Yeah, I felt and really bad about he that. was in he was a uh, you know very instrumental in discussing and dealing with the Kennedy assassination and, and the CTE concussion and the CTE stuff. He's yeah. he's he's quite well known on. He was the, playing by Albert Brooks in the concussion. The, yeah, right, right, right. And well, so you're writing a play about him? Yeah, yeah. I started on it. We would meet once a month. You have lunch and. Um, I have all his books and everything, and so that's on the back burner. I want to get back on that, but also, uh, so so okay. So what are you doing? Then what are you doing to get yourself back into this? Well, I'm going to tell you what. I have a um, very good friend who is a um, doctor, Cal Boston. He's a dramaturg. Uh-huh. So working with him and my director Montez Freeland on our current play, Savior Samuel, it's really been helpful because after my accident in 2015. We had did a reading of Miss Julie Carissa and John down at American Stage, and Cal came down and took notes and everything and everything. And after my accident, I, I couldn't remember anything. So he refreshed my memory, and we were able to work on the script and get it ready for that fall and spring. So we got like a little team now. And um, what I was going to say, my August Wilson influence, is that I'm working on a century cycle um, from the 19th century. Wow. So I've written four plays already. Um, this one that we're doing now is the second one. And then I have one about the horse jockeys called um, Bluegrass Mile. And then I have one that I'm working on, which is actually a commission. It's called, uh, it's called Abe and I, uh, about Abe Lincoln and um, William, the guy that worked with him. So anyway, that's that, my goal is to write yeah, that's, write the new. That sounds uh, like that would be great. Yeah, the nineteenth century. So, so it's it's been fun, and I I think I'm coming out of my um, funk funk. Yeah, because my daughter just graduated from creative writing, and she's going to be doing a lot Who of. We've hardly talked to here, but yeah, we'll, we'll get her on here someday. Yeah, yeah, she she's she's been a great inspiration, and that whole I want to go to LA and do stuff. So I need to shift. How I wanted to do things. So to now her. you now you need that's good. And now you need to think of yourself. I think mm-hmm. I'm saying this for the world to hear. I think you need to think of yourself as a, as a different person who's able to do who has this skill set mm-hmm. to tell us what it's like to have gone through what you've gone through. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wrote a book. I just haven't I haven't shopped it yet. It's called the Ninety Nine Chronicles. Was, I used to I used to put a chronicle on my Facebook page about my recovery. So I've written 99 of them. And, um, and you're going to publish them? Yeah. Um, Kirkland from the Post-Gazette, he edited it as long as, as well as um, Stephen Dorfler, who edited it initially, um, our, our webmaster. And um, it's pretty long. It's like 400-something well, pages. <laughs> well, but your, your experiences are your experiences, and you have the capacity, the skill set, in order to communicate that to us. Right. So, it's got to stay focused. Well... <laughs> All right, so you, you'll 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 get better and better at staying yeah. focused. There's no doubt. All right, last two questions, okay? Because we've gone for just over an hour, okay? Which has been a lot of fun. It's been very entertaining and interesting. Um, okay, so you've you've clearly worked with lots of people in the business over a very long period of time from mm-hmm. all different aspects of the world. Um, do you have a quirky, funny, oddball, offbeat, strange, or weird story that you can share with us, or just plain funny story? I was thinking about it. I mean, you know, when you sit around with actors and directors, you sit around and talk about stuff. Everybody tells you a little different story. You, these stories come out of nowhere that were right deep in your memory. You forget sure. them. So I don't have really have a really big one. I guess a bunch of little small ones. We we had this one actor. I'm not going to say his name. I'm not going to say his name. All right. But <laughs> he always... You know, he he always struggled memorizing the lines, so we always had to find a good role for him that wasn't really big, <laughs> small role. So he played a lot of dead people. <laughs> so, but the, Not much to memorize but there. In the, the one play of, of mine called Nine Days in the Sun, it takes place in the coroner's office, and, of course, he plays the body. <laughs> and so he's backstage on the gurney, you know what I mean? And they roll him out on stage, and he was asleep. <laughs> and, was he snoring? <laughs> no, but he was asleep. <laughs> and he woke up <laughs> and he looked around, saw the audience, and he went back to he went and played dead. It was so hilarious, man. He's like he like he he, he didn't sit up but he opened his eyes and turned his head and he said, Oh, I'm supposed to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> and and another another Did it get a laugh from the audience? Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. 
Uh, but, you know. It's like something out of the Carol Burnett show. You know? <laughs> yeah, something just, Tim Conway. Tim Conway just wake up and go back yeah. to sleep. But he also was in another play. And I've got three stories about him. They're real short. They're all short. Sure. He was in another play, um, and he he was in Jitney, and he was the drunk. He was the guy who drinks. And he went to reach down in the couch, and he's supposed to bring out a bottle and drink some. And Solo Dean says, "What I tell you about drinking in here, you know?" And he he couldn't find the bottle. The bottle was there. so he comes up and he puts his thumb in his mouth and he goes like that, like he's drinking his thumb. And we were like, "What?" The heck? Well, at least he was, was thinking hilarious. a little bit on his feet. But the last story, he's playing a dead person again. And it's in a play Corey Rieger wrote called Stain, and it's about this family and. You know, Uncle was drunk, and he gets in the he gets in the um, backhoe. He digs up the grandpa, he digs him up, and he he brings him in. And we got so we got this guy wrapped up in a we got him wrapped up in a, a um a, a, a carpet. Okay, and like and rolled it's a white up. family, and he's a brother, you know, and and we got him rolled up in there. But it's not him. It's just it's like a it's a dummy, right? And through this whole scene, they keep hiding the body, hiding the body, keep hiding the body. And then I added a blackout. I added a, like a blackout. And during the blackout, he comes in and they roll him up in the carpet. And then at the end of the play, the carpet's on the couch and they open it up and it's him. And they're like, that's not grandpa. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it, it was called Stain. So I get an email, a long, angry email from a woman. And she says, you know, I love your theater, but I am very disappointed that you would have that young man stay wrapped up in the carpet for so long. <laughs> and I had to explain to her that he was only in there for like a less than a minute, you know, a he, minute or two. You should have you should have said to her, we're just lucky he didn't wake up in the middle. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. All right. But, so, so last question for you, Mark. Um, do you have a solid piece of advice or a tip for someone who's starting out and wants to make good in the business or someone who's been in the business a while but's trying to take it to the next level? Either right. one. Yeah. If you want to be a playwright, an actor, a director, or whatever, you know, when you were born, there was nothing in your DNA to say it. That's not going to be you. You know what I mean? There's, mm -hmm. you, you can't keep looking at other people's success, other people's failures, and let and attach that to yourself. You know, you could do anything you want to do in this world, and you just have to go and do it. It might take some people might get there quicker than you, or you might get there quicker than some other people. But you're not going to know until you do it. You got to make it work. You got to try and you know learn as many skills as you can, and don't get trapped in that skill. You know, uh, keep working toward what it is that you want to do, um, and and don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't let your pride get in the way, you know. But um, there's people out here that are willing to help, but you have to ask. People aren't going to say, hey, you need some help. You got to ask for help. And help comes in many ways, you know. It comes in advice. It comes in the monetary, of course. It comes in somebody letting you leave, use their couch, you know, so you get on your feet. Um, but you could do anything you want. Anybody can do anything they want. You know, the way this world is now, there's people out here that – or millionaires don't even know how they got to be a millionaire. They just lucked up on something. Mm -hmm. but there's also people I watch. I was I was I was in the room when Viola Davis when Viola Davis went from a great actor to a star. I was in the room. I was I was understudying Ving Rhames in the, the movie um, Still I Rise, and um, I ran three. I ran up and down the hall with Viola Davis three times in Veen Rame's place while they got the cameras and everything ready. And she was focused. We talked about plays she did before. I knew she did plays with Anthony Chisholm, Off-Broadway. I saw her rise. And the next next week, she was a star because she had her big uh, Essence. She had her big, her big um, cover story in Essence magazine. Mm -hmm. And she did that while she was doing this. And she had just, I just, I talked to her about Fences on Broadway because I saw it on Broadway. And then she came and did Fences here in Pittsburgh. And so I, I saw how it happened. But she wasn't an overnight success. You know, she 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 went to school. She worked hard. She did a lot of plays. And, you know, she's a star now. So I've seen it. I've seen a lot of people. As a photographer for the Pittsburgh Courier, I've been around a lot of music music stars and, um, and film people. 
and just see, you know, there's a lot of handlers, a lot of things. You know, you when you're a photographer, you get backstage and you see a lot of things. Um, Phyllis Hyman asked me to go have a drink with her. And I, I was, I mean, she was a big woman. She was beautiful. And, you know, this big voluptuous woman, she's like, you want to go have a drink? And I'm like... Uh, I'm only 19. <laughs> I still kick myself in the butt. I sort of want to have a drink with her. You know what I mean? But but you never know who you're going to meet. You know, you never you go, whose paths you're going to cross. The thing is, is to to work at it and be prepared. Always be prepared. You could never be more prepared. You know what I mean? I I think that you you've just given us about six or seven good pieces of advice, uh, and I think that they're all extremely wise. You've got to work at it. Mm-hmm. You have to be collaborative. It is a collaborative business. It's, right. I mean, so, yeah, there are solo parts of it. Like being a playwright is typically solo, but nevertheless, after you've written it, then it requires a lot of people to put something on. It takes right. many people. So I think those are very very valuable and wise pieces of advice. So mm-hmm. I thank you for telling us that because yeah. and and I know that that's what you're still doing. You're still working. Absolutely. on Absolutely. Don't let your ego get in the way. Mm, oh, that's a big yeah, one. Yeah, I used to always say, oh, dramaturg. Who needs a dramaturg? You know what I mean? That's what a lot of people fought the whole dramaturg thing when it first really came on strong. But you know what? The <clears throat> dramaturg will 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 steer you in the right direction. Because I'll be honest with you, a lot of a lot of playwrights, a lot of young playwrights don't know what they're writing. They have an idea what they're writing, but they don't know where it's going to go. Because once you create sure. these characters, they're going to take off in different directions. You have to corral them and make it make sense. You can go crazy. I've seen people have a play reading, and they walk out the room, and they're more confused than when they walked in. You know what I'm saying? Well, because they, they're now hearing it for the first time. Right. And everybody's of, chiming instead in. Instead of somebody else giving you some advice along the way. Right. Which is right. what the dramaturg will help Absolutely. do. Absolutely. Um, well, I want to thank you so much for coming in today, and, and you too, Ashley. Thank you so much. Okay. And and um, mm-hmm. I'm so glad that you were able to spend a little time giving us some of your history and background and, and, and uh, philosophy on how to do this. Thanks for having us, Stephen. It's a, been a great pleasure. Thank you. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great episodes to you. This podcast would not have been possible without the generous support of the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.